Okay, hopefully everybody did well in the test. Uh, Andrew's still still waiting. And so I, I have not graded because I'm waiting for him. But today we're going to essentially go over what we did in lab, what we learned, what you explored on Monday. I thought about just going on to the next material, which would keep us right on schedule with the lectures. But I felt that it would be best to review it because it has been a week and it was self-taught. Now you can go back and compare to my lectures about it and at your learning. So we're going to learn about electricity. <laughs> Poor girl trying to comb her hair. We've all had experiences something like this, right? You have the plastic comb, and while this here is clearly not the normal, you have your hair kind of sticks to the comb, bring the comb, you comb it one way, you lift it away, pull it the other way, and your hair goes back the way you went. Maybe we've all had that. Um, so why does that occur? It occurs because of electric phenomena, what we call static electricity. What does the word static mean? Not moving in this case. Static means constant or stationary. So static electricity is what we call, what we're studying right now, electricity that's not moving, at least not continuously. So in a situation with that comb, the comb is going to do exactly like we learned if we take rubber and we rub it with fur, like our hair, it's going to rub so that we have extra electrons on one and not enough on the other. But then we're going to have an attraction because they have opposite charges. So that's what's going on there. We've already seen enough to go over that. Andrew became the master of doing this stuff. I don't know if everybody was watching him during presentation and preparation. But he was doing a lot of stuff with these little pith balls. And the pith balls can be made to do cool things. In the picture on the left, I believe both of the balls are attracted to the rod. The picture on the right, the balls are repelled from each other. Based on what you've learned about the electrostatic force, the static force between charged objects, what do you suppose is going on in the picture on the right there? They're both the same charge because like charges repel. Now, in the case where they're both sticking to the rod, that would also make some sense. If the, if the rod is one charge and the balls are the other charge, they would both stick. But that's not actually what's going on in that picture. So let's try to learn a little bit more about these pith balls. Okay, I already talked about that picture. You can see I'm going through quickly because we've already seen a lot of this. The pith balls... Oh, there is a nice picture of the pith balls, but I'm going to have to wait on the pith balls because of the order of my slides and the, the questions. So the first and fundamental rule that we saw is that like charges, whether it's positive and positive or negative with negative, repel each other. But opposite charges attract. Now you see in the lower left, there's an electroscope. That's a different kind of electroscope than this type but it still has the same fundamental behavior. If you're going to have the same charge on both of those little leaves, there's a leaf here and a leaf here. They're just connected to the same rod, so they're going to have the same type of charge. So if you have a charge, they're both going to be the same, and it's always going to be repulsive. So these leaves will hang straight down if the charge is zero, if it's positive charge, they'll repel. If it's negative charge, they'll also repel. Okay, so our first clicker question, as you all saw, I pulled out your clickers. Come on, go forward. Suppose Denford and Andrew, I expected Denford to be here, are both positively charged. What can you say about the electrostatic force between them? So pretend that Denford is here so that, you know, it's a realistic question. Okay, 
Every single person knows that aspect. Like charges repel. Oops. Sometimes I don't think what I'm doing, I go forward to the wrong machine. Now, Benjamin Franklin. One of my former students posted a link on Facebook yesterday about 15 things that you were taught that are incorrect. And a number of those were physics things. Things like that Columbus discovered that the world was round, that the earth was round. You know, that was known before Christ's time, like 2,000 years before the birth of Christ, that the earth was a sphere. So that was not a revelation of Columbus. Well, one of them had to do with Ben Franklin and the kite experiment. And I believe one of our groups spoke to that. So what was the purpose of Ben Franklin's kite experiment? A group that spoke gave us a clear answer on that, I'm pretty certain. No. The, the experiment was to show that lightning was an electrical phenomenon. Now, did he do the experiment? Did his kite get struck by lightning? These are questions that we don't know the answer to. It might have been, much like another one that was in that list of things you were taught incorrectly, the apple falling on Newton's head. Now this, because it's just written by people who want to provoke you, said that didn't happen. We don't know that it didn't happen, but we assume it was unlikely to have happened. This here could have been likewise a story to explain it. Um, people have done some calculations, and if lightning had struck his kite and he had that metal kite string, he would have died. So it's really unlikely that he actually did the experiment the way that we understand it. Um, some people conjecture, well, maybe lightning came close to his, um, to his kite, and then it caused an electrical arc between the key and whatever was down below it. Who knows, right? But it's a good story to help keep in our heads that lightning is just an example of electricity. So I... <laughs> Later on, my organization is not as perfect as it could be. I did this at 5.30 this morning instead of going to the gym. Later on, we'll have a video showing lightning so we can talk about it. So, two fundamental types of charge, positive and negative. Ben Franklin believed that there was a fluid that was carrying charge. Should sound familiar because we talked about a fluid before in a situation where we don't believe there's a fluid. Can you remember the other situation where we talked about a fluid that doesn't quite match up with what we believe today? The what? Not that one. That, that is a, a legitimate example. Not the one I'm looking for. Which one? Forces. Not forces. I think the most recent thing we've studied. Not temperature, but heat. The common theory was that heat was a fluid. You had the caloric that brought warmth and the frigidic that brought cool. And then people discovered, no, it's just energy moving. Well, Franklin believed that you had a fluid for electric charge. And he just randomly made the decision to call whatever was on the amber negative, and amber having that Greek word electron. That's how we have electrons for the negative charge carriers. So electrons are negative, and they're the things that move. Now, we do have positive charges. The positive charges are protons. Those are the fundamental positive charges. And a proton has a charge exactly equal magnitude to the electron, but opposite in sign. Protons are positive charges. Electrons are negative charges. Both of them have a charge in units that we call coulombs. So the unit of charge is a coulomb. 
and electron is minus 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. It's a really small number, right? Times 10 to the minus 19. A proton is plus 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So those are our fundamental charges. Now, if somebody wants to look it up, you can find out that quarks don't have integer multiples of this. Quarks are two-thirds and one-third of this value. But as we understand things, quarks can only be found either in quark-antiquark -quark pairs that we call mesons or in groups of three quarks. And those groups of three quarks are called um, baryons. And a proton is a group of three quarks. In fact, a proton is an up, up, down quark, or particle. And the ups, ups have a charge of plus two-thirds, the charge of an electron. We use that symbol E for the magnitude of a charge of an electron. And downs have a charge of minus one-third electron charge. So an up, up, down is going to be two-thirds, just add them together, plus two-thirds, plus a negative one-third, which adds up to one. So a proton has a charge of equal to positive one electron. Now, there are other things in the nucleus of an atom besides protons. What's the other thing inside the nucleus of an atom? Neutron. Called a neutron because it's a neutral particle. And neutrons, so proton was up, up, down, therefore it has a charge of two-thirds E plus two-thirds E plus minus one-third E equals plus E. A neutron is an up, down, down. So its charge, what's the charge for an up? Plus two-thirds. What's the charge of a down? Minus one-third. And we have two down, so I have to put two of them in here. And if you add those up, two-thirds minus a third minus a third gives me zero. And so a neutron has a charge of zero. But we never see the quarks by themselves, so we still stick with saying that this here is the fundamental unit of charge, the electron. Now, in matter, like this rubber rod, I have atoms. Atoms have a nucleus that contains protons and neutrons. And since this is solid state... What can you tell me about the molecules? Something you prepared for the test on Friday. It's solids of the molecules. Maybe they're fixing outside. You know where the column is falling? You guys haven't looked? Oh, they just report the concrete and pretend it didn't sink. They were taking over the jackhammer this morning to go bust Well, I hope they do something to keep it from sinking further. Um, okay, so we'll ignore the sound effects. Kind of. It's a solid, so the molecules are not free to move. They're in fixed positions in a solid. Remember, solid, fixed positions. A liquid, they can move past each other, but they can't get away. And in a gas, they're free to leave. So the protons and neutrons are fixed in place. They can just do tiny little vibrations. But atoms also have electrons that are bound to the nucleus. And the furthest out electrons might be able to move. In this, it's an insulator. The electrons aren't able to move. And so, well, that's what makes an insulator. The electrons aren't able to move. If it has electrons, so if I rub it, I can rub electrons off, or I could rub electrons on from something else, but they're going to be stuck exactly where 
they were. So when I rub this, if I do something like, let me use the glass. Let's say I take the glass and I only rub half of the glass. I'm only going to have a charge on the half I rubbed, not on the other half. So if I bring it up like this, I'll have nothing transfer if I bring it like this. Oh, come on. That's the side I rubbed. It should have transferred there. That's what happens when you do something spur of the moment. But the charge is only on the side where I rubbed because it's an insulator. But when I rub it, I'm either rubbing electrons onto it or off of it. The protons don't move. The protons are stuck. It's going to be a wonderful day. So conductors, the difference in a conductor and an insulator is in the conductors, the last electrons, the lowest energy electrons, those electrons actually can leave the nucleus that they came with. It's kind of like you go to a party and you bring a date and with an insulator you're the nucleus, the date is your electrons. With an insulator the date stays with you. But with the conductor you come with the date and once you get there you just start you know mingling and your date may go off with someone else. You may pick up a different date. That's what's going on with conductors. The electrons are free to move around. They don't have to stay with the one that brought them. And so since they can move around with relatively low energy required, if I have a conductor and I put charge on one place, it will freely pass wherever it wants as long as it's within that conductor. Now, leaving the conductor, that's hard, but it can move around within the conductor. Oh, there's one more thing on here, semiconductors. Semiconductors are special materials where you have the energy required to make an electron break free from the nucleus and move around is reasonably small. So it doesn't take too much energy to make it start conducting. Or you can dope the semiconductors, you can put materials in them. You can make it so they conduct, but only with a small amount of energy you can suppress the conduction. So those are materials that we can control the conduction because they're close to the boundary between conductors and insulators. And of course they're key to our electronic devices. Now back to the pith balls. The pith or you could take styrofoam, you'll have the same behavior. In fact, those are probably styrofoam, not pith. Um, it's what we call a dielectric. It has a, an electric dipole moment. Dipole means two poles. If you're talking about charge, you electric, then that means you have a positive side and a negative side. Here's an example of a molecule with an electric dipole moment. What do we traditionally call this molecule? Water. Okay, water is a dipole, an electric dipole, because the oxygen really digs electrons. It has a strong attraction for electrons. And the hydrogen, eh, it likes the electrons, but it's okay without it. And so what happens is the electrons for each of these hydrogen atoms, the hydrogen atom just has one electron each, those electrons get pulled closer to the oxygen and they spend more of their time with the oxygen and less of their time with the hydrogen. So in the end, it's like you have a plus, plus, and well that's supposed to be a double minus, it looks like an equal hook that way, a double minus. Now, it's, it doesn't share the electron exactly that way, it's like, you know, <laughs> plus 0.75, plus 0.75, minus 1.5, or something like that. But you have a net effect of having an object that is negative on this side because it has extra electrons, and positive on this side because it pulled the electrons away. And so water molecules have an electric dipole moment. 
Now, this picture with the pith ball explains what I'm going to try to explain with pictures. Let us imagine that I have an electric dipole that's like this. And I bring up near a nice negatively charged object. What can you tell me about the forces on the green dipole caused by my negative object? Okay, which one is it attracting? Okay, it's attracting the positive and repelling the negative. What's the net force going to be? You don't even know the equations yet, but it's probably going to be zero net force. But it's not zero net torque. Because about the center here, we have you know perpendicular distance. And each one of those is going to make it rotate in a counterclockwise direction. So we have a net torque to make it rotate. And so what's this going to do if it's free to rotate? What will it become? <laughs> that was perfect. I'm trying to reproduce and I did not do it right. You can't see what I'm doing right? Nope. I'm waiting for an answer. Okay, those torques are going to make it rotate So it's like this. Now something we're going to learn like in the next slide or two is that the force between charges is an inverse square. Force is equal to KQ1, Q2 over the separation squared. So ones that are closer, if R is smaller, what does that make the force? Larger. So that means that the force for the closer charge is going to be a larger force. The force for the smaller charge is now going to be, or farther charge is now going to be a smaller force. So now there's a net force. What direction is that net force? I take this and add it to that, and I have as a resultant that. So there's my net force. If I have a net force to the left, what happens to the particle? It accelerates to the left. And so if it started rest, it's going to speed up until it hits the object. Now when it hits the object, if this has excess negative charge, what happens? If you make contact, just like with thermodynamics, if you have two things you make contact, you can have conduction between them. And so if I have excess electrons on the red thing, what's going to happen when they touch? It'll transfer it. So when they touch, okay, just redrawing this, it's quicker. This thing is going to build, have negative charge transferred to it. Even if it has its little dipole, the total charge transferred is usually going to swamp that dipole's effect. And so then what happens once it touches? Then you have a force that is clearly repulsive because negative repels negative. And it's moved back away. Now water does this for us. You probably noticed that sometimes static is a real problem. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Right? It just doesn't affect anything. And the reason has to do with humidity, how much water is in the air. If you have low humidity, humidity, there's not much water in the air. And so you don't have much doing this action because water is a dipole. If it's high humidity, you have a lot of water in the air. You have a lot of this action occurring. Well, what was the net result for the red object? It had charge taken away. 
the water molecules will be attracted to a charged object, transfer charge and take that charge away so that charges tend to drain off quickly if you have a high humidity, high water content in the air. If you have a low water content that doesn't happen much and so things stay charged for much longer times and you have much bigger static electricity things. Another thing that's really cool about this, if I had my Van de Graaff generator working, I could take a stream of water and have it come down, you know, just come out a hole and stream away. And then you bring a charged rod and the water will always be attracted to that charged rod. So you can make the water come out and then go being attracted. It's very cool. Why is it attracted? Because of this dipole, electric dipole, water molecules, electric dipoles. So this picture here is illustrating a pith ball and you have all these little electric dipoles. So each one is aligning and making it attracted. And if this was a negative charge and positive charge, what would have happened differently? If these were all negatives instead of positives, what would have been different? Okay, I see people thinking I couldn't hear answers. Let's blame the construction out there. If these were negatives instead of positives, then each one of these dipoles would have just been flipped the other direction. And it still would have been attracted. Once it touches, it still would transfer charge. So you have the same effect, whether it's positive or negative charge, it's always going to attract until you transfer charge and then they're the same and it repels. So that's what Andrew was having fun with last Monday in lab. So here's an example of styrofoam sticking. In this case, you didn't transfer enough charge for it to be repulsive and you still have the net attraction. And I'm sure you dealt with that. So our next clicker question. Which you can answer now. Conductors are always, oh wait, no, that's A. Which statement is true? Only one of these is true, so choose the one that's true. Like Rachel did. And Tyler. Okay. I know the first four were all correct. Let's see how the last. Well. The last ones didn't agree with the first ones. These were fairly disparate statements, but they were about conductors and insulators. So let's talk about these. Conductors are always charged. A conductor, what does it mean if an object is a conductor? Okay, it means charge can move through it. You can make it positive, you can make it negative, and if you can make it positive or negative, you can also make it neutral. How do you make the conductor positive? Remember, every object has fixed positive charges and then it has negative charges which on a conductor can move and on an insulator they can't. How do you make a conductor positive? Take away. Take away the electrons because the protons are stuck in the nuclei in their fixed positions so you take away the electrons and you make a conductor positive. You add extra electrons, you make it negative give it the same number of electrons that it has protons and it's neutral. So this one was not a correct answer because it just depends on what you did to it. Insulators are never charged. An insulator, it looks like this, what's the difference between an insulator and a conductor? The electrons can't move in the insulator, but they could move in the conductor. 
we can still take electrons away from it or add electrons to it. We just can't move them around on it. And so that's incorrect because you can charge positively or negative an insulator as well. Insulators do not have electrons. Conductors do not have electrons. Well, both of those, everybody agreed, were wrong because all materials have atoms which have protons and electrons and neutrons. Then we get to the final two. The definition of a conductor is that charge can move. The definition of an insulator is the charge cannot move. Okay, Coulomb's law. I think it was Charles, something, something to Coulomb, who did experiments determining how the force varied between objects. And so he did stuff back then. They didn't have nearly the sophistication we have, but he did stuff like take two spheres and touch them both to the same object and measure the force between them. And then ground one, touch the two together so you've now cut the charges in half and measure the force again. And so by varying the charges, he was able to determine that the force was proportional to the product of the charges. So the force between two things is proportional to the product of the charges and it's inversely proportional to the separation squared. Now I wrote this on a preceding slide, but this looks just like another law we've learned. Does this remind anyone of another law? Another law that has gravity. It has a G instead of a K out here. And it has the gravitational charges, what we call mass. And it's the product of the two masses divided by the separation squared. These two equations are essentially the same thing, but they're different forces, so you have a different constant, and the types of charges are different. With gravitational force, you only have one type of charge. It's always a positive charge. Right? There is no such thing as a negative mass. But with electric charge, there's both a positive electric charge and a negative electric charge. So there's something different. We would say gravitational charges are unipolar. They're all the same, you know, all positive. Whereas we have dipolar electric charges. Some are positive, some are negative. Still divided by separation squared. So a lot of the things that we've learned with gravitation, we can apply to electricity. And so we will be learning in lab today about voltage. The real name for voltage is not voltage. The real name is electric potential. And electric potential is defined as, well, let me not do it there. I'll do a separate line. It's defined as the change in electric potential, we use the symbol V for electric potential, is equal to the change in electric potential energy divided by charge. Now let's look at what this would have been if we had done it with gravitational instead of electrical. With gravitational on Earth, that's supposed to be potential, that last word. It would be the gravitational potential energy would be changing potential energy due to gravity. That's a G, if you believe it. Divided by what? Do, what's the symbol we use for gravitational charge? I said it recently. It's unipolar, only has positive values.
mass. So we define, divide it by the gravitational charge since we're doing the gravitational potential. And if you're on the surface of the Earth, that would be mg delta h over m. And we just have g delta h. Since g is a constant, the gravitational potential would essentially be equivalent to the elevation. The higher the elevation, the higher the gravitational potential. The lower the elevation, the lower the gravitational potential. Because it has to do with potential energy, the higher the elevation, the higher the gravitational potential energy. If we were not close to Earth, if we were far from Earth, then we have to use the other equation we would still have one mass cancel out um, there, I didn't put a sign here so it would actually be like that um, it, it gets a little more confusing but we have something like that for the gravitational potential now nobody talks about gravitational potential really they just talk about elevation but when you talk about electric potential, you can think of it like you do elevation then. So if something has a high voltage, it means it has a high electric potential. It's the same as if I have a ball with a high elevation. If I let go, what's it going to do? It's going to fall down. So if I have a charge and it has a high voltage, if I let go, it should fall lower voltage. But there's a catch. That's if it's a positive charge. Remember, all mass was positive. If it's a negative charge, it does the reverse. So a positive charge will naturally fall to lower potential. A negative charge will actually fall to higher potential. In both cases, they're going to lowest potential energy. Okay, sticking with the program. Coulomb's law. K is just a constant. 8.9. 8, 8 times 10 to the 9th, if I remember right. So that to rounding off to three decimal places, it's 9. So that's why the textbook just gives us 9. So we have that constant. Multiply by charge 1, multiply by charge 2, divide by r squared. What are the units for charge? They're coulombs named after <laughs> the gentleman who came up with this law. That's how you spell Coulomb. I think it's Charles Augustine de Coulomb. I think that's his name. Okay, now charging by conduction and induction. We had a nice demonstration in lab about charging by conduction and induction. This picture here shows nicely how you charge by conduction. You have to have direct contact. So here we had contact. And with that direct contact, charge can move. And so if I have something that has a bunch of extra electrons, if I touch it to something that doesn't, it's going to push electrons onto it because the electrons are repelling. So each electron wants to get away from the rest. And so electrons flow onto my electroscope. And you see this electroscope is exactly the same type that we have seen on front. So that charge, notice the charge is distributed throughout the electroscope. It's not just on the moving part. It's not just on the vertical parts here. It's everywhere spread out. And so because we have the same type of charge, repulsive, and it moves out. So conduction, direct contact, transfer of charge. Induction is a little more complicated. For induction, here we bring a rod that has an excess negative charge close to a neutral ball. Now because that ball is a conductor, the electrons on the ball are going to be pushed away, leaving positive charge close to my rod, negative charge on the other side. Now if 
I were to connect a wire to ground here, this is repelling electrons. So electrons from this would be repelled and go to ground. And so I would have electrons that would be removed from that ball, doesn't matter where I connect the wire, because the rod is trying to push electrons away. And I gave them an avenue where they could get away. Well then, if I cut that wire, or separate that wire, now the charge in the ball is stuck. But since electrons were pushed away, it's stuck with a positive charge. And then I simply take this bad boy away and I have my little ball with positive charge. So the key for induction is that the charged object didn't touch it. I brought something else in contact and I had conduction with the other thing, not with the charged object. But that charged object caused charge to move when I grounded it. We call it grounding when we put a connection between the earth and the object. That's ground, the earth. That's why it's called grounding. <clears throat> okay, so this is just going through the steps I just described. This is using your finger. Why your finger? Because your body also acts kind of like an electron source or sink. We can absorb a lot of electrons or give up a lot of electrons on our bikes without making much difference. Okay, so, clicker question number three. Which type of charging does not require contact with the charged object? And that's the thing I'm going to charge, and the charged object don't touch each other. Excellent. I should have said excellent before Joe answered and then said his name because if he had answered incorrectly, you would have known. Well, now you know that everyone answered correctly so you can all feel good. Charging by induction. Doesn't have direct contact between the charging object and the object to be charged. Okay, the Van de Graaff generator, <laughs> if ours had worked nicely, we might have had something, although that's probably a higher voltage still to get that kind of experience. This picture here illustrates the same types of rollers that we have on our Van de Graaff generator. The top one's acrylic, the bottom one, some kind of metal. You have essentially the rubbing action that puts a positive charge on the rubber when it leaves the metal. And so you have positive charge that's moving up. When it gets to the top, that positive charge is picked up by the comb on top and distributed on the globe. And you have negative charge that comes back down. Now, what really moves? Protons or electrons? The electrons are what really moves. So what really happens is electrons are pulled away from the rubber belt at the bottom. And those electrons that were pulled away are collected by the little comb underneath. So this comb right here, number seven, is collecting the electrons. And that's why my Van de Graaff generator has a little ground connection. You can connect that ground to drain the electrons off instead of letting them build up. Because it'll allow you to get you know, more charge at the top. So I have a rubber belt coming up to the top that's missing electrons. It gets up to the top and it pulls electrons from the globe onto the belt. So electrons are being pulled from the globe. The combs deposit on the belt. They come down and then they go out here. So the dome has less and less electrons on it, getting more and more of a positive charge. Now when that young lady puts her hand on there, that charge goes throughout her body. And so her entire body has a positive charge. That means electrons are pulled off of her entire body. And so her hair, positive charge. Each hair is repelled by each other hair, and so the hair is trying to get away from the other hair as much as it can. And to get away, it's standing up. 
So the force is caused by the electrostatic force, that coulombic force, force equal to KQ1, Q2 over R squared, are bigger here than the gravitational force of the hair. It dominates and just makes it stand out. So that's what the Van de Graaff generator is supposed to do for us. This summer I will really work hard to try to rehabilitate it. Okay, now lightning. A couple slides on lightning here. Well, and then some, some video. So if you look at lightning, we had students talk about this. You have essentially water falling through ice, giving you the same kind of rubbing action that makes the bottom of the cloud negative. And that negative charge makes the region underneath the cloud positive because the negative charge is pushing away negative charge below it, leaving the positive. Notice the lightning strikes here. It shows four different types of lightning strikes. This one here from the bottom of the cloud to the earth. I'm going to change color. Green is just not standing out for me. Magenta will. Okay, so there's one kind, and that's the kind we usually focus on. Here's one going from the top of the cloud down to the earth away from where the cloud is. You've heard of lightning strikes where there's no clouds. Well, it's something like this where it went laterally to where you had the excess charge that was pushed away, the negative charge pushed away, came up here, and then that goes to the top. Or you have two different types of lightning strikes. This one's within the cloud, this one's between clouds. I think it's something like 85% of all lightning strikes are just within clouds or between clouds. Only about 15% of the lightning strikes, I didn't look this up, so it's just my memory, actually are strikes of the earth. So when you hear thunder, it's, oftentimes you don't see the lightning. That's because that lightning was up there between clouds and you can't see it. You might be able to see lights flashing up there and not down here because of the lightning going between clouds. Now, let's look at this picture, which, of course, on my tablet, you don't see the animation. Um, change this to the right thing. Oh, wait. <laughs> I, sorry, I was totally not on top of things. I just need to go to the next slide because the next slide has the animation running. So this is very cool. This is a GIF of a lightning strike. And so you have the beginning. You have these little traces that are coming down from the cloud. That's electric discharge just going through the air. Then it connects to the ground and huge transfer of energy. That transfer of energy makes light and sound. It actually is heating up the air to extreme temperatures because of all the charge going through. And of course, when the air gets hot, what does it do? It expands. And those thunders, you're hearing the sound of the air rapidly expanding because of the rapid heating caused by the electric charge going through it so quickly. So I think that is a highly cool graphic that allows you to see what's really going on with lightning. And now here is an animation of the same thing. So you have the quickie mark, QKM, and you have your little lightning things trying to reach down and makes contact. Okay. It's clear you guys are not as excited about this as I am. But physics is all about this kind of cool stuff. Which is why you're taking it, right? So, a question here about Benjamin Franklin. Why did he do his kite experiment again? If he did it. Okay, everybody said the right answer. No one said to show that lightning was safe. That's good, because it's not safe. 
<laughs> Those were kind of silly. Thank you for answering correctly. Um, that, that's the end. Have a great day. I'll see you in the lab this afternoon.